Albania kind of disappears and then Turkey is not really on the map, but theoretically could be on the map. This is part of Europe's self-understanding. Perhaps the fundamental strand in defining what it is to be a European down the centuries is that it's not what is Islamic. And Nick Griffin and uh, analogous people across Europe and in the United States as well would say that's because that's the essence of what it is to be Western. It is to reject the Muslim as the archetype of difference of the rejected other. So, for instance, we find practical consequences of this that uh, in a recent poll, 58% of French voters said they would never vote for an Arab. So there isn't a single Arab Muslim in the French parliament. Here we're a bit more open to our credit. Plenty of Muslims, plenty of people of color in Westminster. In France, they're not quite so comfortable with that. And they will not vote for an Arab, still less for a Muslim. And why is that? Because they do have the sense of being at the heart of the Western Enlightenment story. Paris as every cultivated man's second capital, and Islam as being the exact opposite of that. These unpleasant immigrants who are in the ghettos, who are taking our jobs, who fought against us in Algeria, who are the exact opposite of what the French Enlightenment is supposed to be. So 58% of them say they would never vote for an Arab. Other examples could be cited. Pim Fortoin in Holland, somebody who took himself to be a champion of Westernness, he wrote a book called Against the Islamization of Our Culture. He wanted to ban all of the mosques in Holland. He wanted religiously specific uh, immigration laws. He was Islamophobic, but highly cultivated, a liberal in every other aspect of his life with a freewheeling homosexual lifestyle. But when it came to the Muslim issue, he was quite clear. Islam and the West are not compatible. And plenty of other uh, individual situations could... Uh, could um, come to mind. The current mood in uh, right-wing circles in Washington, for instance. The idea of the new American century as being precisely that which is against the Islamic Saracenic Arab other. That's why we have to support Israel. That's why the Palestinians shouldn't receive anything. That's why we need military bases all over the Middle East. That's why we need to keep those regimes under control. That's why we did Iraq. That explains our foreign policy in much of the world. Precisely the sense of the West as being a triumphant culmination of a long-standing European, partly Christian tradition that defines itself precisely as being incompatible with Islam. But there are Muslims who tend to think the same way. The Muslim world is similarly full of xenophobes. The Muslim perception is that the West is materialistic, godless, greedy, adulterous, pornographic, given to gambling, environmentally destructive, uh, usurious, exploits the third world, etc., etc., etc. It is the exact opposite of what a Muslim strives to be. The Muslim, even if he's poor, is dignified and is humble and worships God, and the Westerner is a kind of Tyrannosaurus crashing on other cultures, insistent that his own civilization is the only one that should define the public values in any society on earth. It's his values, whether it be feminism or whether it be liberal capitalism or whether it be anything else that he wants to define as being the public norm. Other cultures can exist in private, but the public space, the political space, the economic system, everything outside the home and outside the place of worship should be that which uh, Westerners find to be normal and decent. That's a widespread Muslim perception. Muslims are afraid of the West. Muslims are not just afraid of the West in its angry military mood, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and other places, but are also afraid in terms of its political penetration, the power of the banks, the power of the multinationals, the globalized banking industry that in effect is controlled by significant power blocks in Washington, Geneva, Paris and elsewhere and doesn't seem to be answerable substantially to the values or concerns of other peoples or other civilizations. It's a major source of alarm. The environmental crisis, which is likely to land on the heads of Muslim communities far more than it lands on the heads of Westerners. In fact, the Canadians and the Russians are quite looking forward to global warming. But in the Muslim world, lots of deserts, lots of vulnerable environmental ecosystems, that's where the burden is most likely to fall. And so there's a constant sermon rhetoric across the Muslim world that the West is actually imperialistic, intolerant, and that it can only tolerate values that are compatible with itself. 
So the Muslims as well, as well as Westerners who say, no, the answer to the question is, Islam and the West are allergic, positive and negative poles, they mutually repel, and you can't possibly have a Western Muslim identity. That's like saying being simultaneously male and female, or simultaneously being a banana and an orange. It's mixing up two different categories. The one is humble and worships God, and the other is arrogant and is destroying the planet, etc. Common rhetoric on both sides. Now, the problem with this is that in the real world, these categories, Islam being something tidy, and the West being something tidy, and the West being a kind of geographical, sometimes civilizational category, and Islam being an allegedly monolithic, single, religious way of viewing the world, things in the human world are never quite that tidy. In fact, they're never tidy at all. The reality is that the West contains people who do indeed believe in the project for a new American century and want military bases in Saudi Arabia and want the fifth fleet cruising off the coast of Iran and all of that. Plenty of people do want that. 10% of Americans subscribe to hardline evangelical views that really regard America as having a kind of imperialistic mission in the world that is going to be the precondition for the second coming of Jesus. If you look at Chris Hedges' book, American Fascists, you'll see there are plenty who are like that. But the Muslim stereotype of them being all like that was shattered last month by the election of Barack Obama, who, for all of his strangenesses and faults, isn't that particular interpretation of what it is to be Western. Similarly, in the Islamic world, there are people, popular preachers in Tehran and uh, elsewhere, who regard the West as being the great Satan and as the exact opposite of what it means to be a peaceful uh, servant of God. But there are also many people, and in my experience the great majority of people who go to the mosques, who might put up with those sermons, who don't want to see themselves as locked in some kind of titanic struggle forever with the great Satan in the West. Most people in the Muslim world, like most Muslims here, if you travel and get to know them, uh, find that they want a world in which people can travel freely and communicate and intermarry and just get on with their lives. Most people aren't as angry as the extremists on both sides would like them to be. Most people do want to get on. So, in the Muslim world, you have this diversity. And sometimes it's hard for people in the West who only understand of Islam that which is media-worthy. It's hard for them to grasp. But the Muslim world is hugely diverse. It's always been diverse. It's getting more and more diverse by the minute. As well as the internal differentiations, the sectarian differences, the ethnic differences, the educational differences that have always made the Muslim world an extraordinary kaleidoscope of different points of view, different theologies, different cultures, you have the impact of modernity, which is being responded to in a huge range of different ways by Muslims. So, recently I attended a lecture in Oxford by the Uzbek ambassador. <coughs> and uh, he was talking about his country and its... Uh, struggle for independence from the Russians, and then somebody who was uh, what the media would call an Islamist radical stood up and asked him why they don't have an Islamic state in Uzbekistan. Now, the Uzbek regime is unpleasant in many ways, but the response he gave was quite an interesting one, and actually shut up the angry man in the back row. He said, we have been under uh, communist rule and under foreign rule for 80 years, completely deta detached from the rest of the Islamic world. We couldn't go on Hajj, we couldn't teach the Quran to our children, we had to eat pork in the schools. That was our reality for 80 years. Now we're, as it were, waking up from that nightmare and we're looking at the Islamic world for possible models. What should we follow? And we didn't find that there is a single Muslim interpretation of how public life in a Muslim culture should be. We look, for instance, at one end of the spectrum and we see the Saudi model, which is that of an absolute monarchy. Well, we don't have a king of Uzbekistan, so that's not for us. Other monarchical models, such as the Moroccan model, with all of its weaknesses and insincerities, but the king calls himself Amir al-Mu'minin, commander of the believers, but it's not quite an absolute monarchy because they do have a kind of national assembly. Or should we go next door to the Algerians, who have a radical socialist republican model, but they're religious Muslims? Or should we go to Turkey, which keeps religion <coughs> absolutely locked away and in many ways persecuted, but still now is able to elect a government made up largely of religious Muslims? Is that our model? 
or is the model the Indonesian model, or is it the Pakistani model of the Islamic Republic?